Letter 38 Bethany, House of Mary and Martha, a month after the Passover I deeply regret, my dearest father, the delays which have detained you so long from arriving at Jerusalem, but trust that, ere many days, the caravan for which you wait will reach Gaza, and that you will be enabled to resume your journey to the Holy City. I am now at Bethany, where I have been some time making my home. Uncle Amos has retired, for the present, to his farm near Jericho, but will be here tomorrow to remain with us. Therefore, when you come near to Jerusalem, instead of going directly into the city, turn aside by the road leading past the king's gardens, and go up the brook of Kedron into the way to Bethany. I pray that God may preserve you in safety, and soon permit me the happiness of once more embracing you after three long years of separation. And what events have transpired in these three years! Once more, my dear father, read carefully over the whole narrative, and answer to yourself this inquiry. Is not this man the Son of God? Is not he the very Christ, the long-looked-for Messiah? Isaiah prophesied of the Christ whom he saw afar off that he should be a man of sorrows, that he should be despised and rejected of men, that he should be taken from prison and judgment and cut off from the land of the living, that he should be numbered with the wicked in his death and make his grave with the rich. How light, how clear, how plain all these prophecies now are to me and to us all. How wonderfully in their minuteness they have been fulfilled, you already know. His resurrection also was foretold by himself, but we did not understand his words until now. When he spoke of destroying the temple and raising it in three days, he spoke of the tabernacle of his body. Oh, how many sayings which, when spoken by his sacred lips we understood not, now rush upon us in all their meaning, proving to us that every step of his life was foreknown to him that he went forward to his death aware of all things whatsoever that were going to befall him. But his resurrection was also foretold by the holy David when he said, Thou wilt not leave his soul in hell, nor suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And his arraignment before Pilate, Caiaphas, and Herod was foretold by David when he said, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Yet the Lord saith, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Also, my dear father, turn to the Psalms 22 of King David and compare the following words, which speak of Messiah, with what I have described in my previous letters. They shoot out the lip at me, they shake the head, they laugh me to scorn. They say, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Read the same psalm of the holy king a little farther, and you will see these words, which were put by the royal prophet into the lips of his future Messiah. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They part my garments among them, and upon my vesture cast lots. Read and compare these prophecies of Messiah with the accounts in my letters, dear father, and you will not only be convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, but you will perceive that his humiliation and sufferings before Pilate and Caiaphas his agony and the cross, his death and burial, instead, as we ignorantly conceived of being evidences that he was not the Christ, are proof that he was the very son of the highest, the Shiloh of Jehovah foretold by the prophets, the anointed king of Israel. Oh, wonderful is all this! How marvelous these things passing before our eyes! Now all is dazzlingly clear. The prophets are unveiled to our sight, and we see that these things must have happened to him. Oh, our darkness, our blindness to have seen in the prophecies of Messiah only the passages which speak of his glory and power. Read the prophets no longer, my dearest father, with the veil before your eyes. See in all you read Jesus as the end of the prophets, the goal of all their far-seeing prophecies, the veritable and sure realization of the prophetic visions. Thus, my dear father, has Jesus in all particulars proved himself to be the subject of all prophecy, the King of Israel? But you will now ask, is he to re-establish the throne of David and live forever? Yes, but not a Jerusalem of earthly splendor. Oh, how clear are all things to my apprehension now! The Jerusalem in which his throne is to be placed is heavenly, and the true Jerusalem of which the present one is but the material type, what the body is to the soul of man. Jesus has talked with me since his resurrection and explained all this to me, and much more that is wonderful and full of joy. It is now four weeks since he arose, and in that time he has been not only seen by all the disciples, but by hundreds of his followers. The only change in his usual appearance to your father to the eye is a transparent paleness, 
which gives a soft radiance to his whole aspect, and a certain majestic reserve, which awes all who draw near to him, so that men speak in his presence in subdued whispers. His mother, happiest of women now, as she was before the most wretched, ever sits at his feet and silently enjoys his sacred presence, seldom speaking and looking up to him rather as a worshipper to her god than a mother upon her son. That he is in the flesh in reality and not a spirit, he has proven to his disciples by eating with them. And in a remarkable way to an incredulous disciple called Thomas, who, not believing that Jesus was risen in his real body from the dead, was told by the divine Lord to place his fingers into his hands and his hand into his side, which Thomas, convinced with all, refused to do, but falling at his feet in amazement and adoration, worshipped him as God. Today his disciples are with him in the gardens of David at Bethlehem, where he is holding daily a solemn council with the eleven, unfolding to them the glory of his kingdom, and opening their understandings to the clear apprehension of all which the prophets have written concerning him. John, who is a member of this divine council, says that the power of Jesus, the extent and majesty of his kingdom, the infinite results of his death and resurrection, are not to be conceived of by those who have not listened to these sublime revelations of his own lips. He hath shown us, said John, how that his true office as son of God and son of man is to be a mediator. He showed us that he himself was the high priest, and how that the cross was the veritable altar of this great world's sacrifice, and its temple the whole earth and heavens. How wonderful, dear father, is all this! He further teaches his disciples that he will shortly ascend from the earth to enter upon his celestial reign, and that his subjects there are to be all who love him and keep his commandments. It is to be a kingdom of holiness, and none will enter there but the pure in heart. He says further, that as we do now confess our sins over the blood of the victim we sacrifice for ourselves in the temple, so henceforth we must look to him, by faith when we shall see him no longer, slain a sacrifice for us, and confess our sins to the Father for his sake. Jesus has moreover taught his disciples that the Gentiles are to share equally with the children of Abraham the benefits of his death and resurrection, that this good news shall be proclaimed to them by his disciples, and that they will gladly hear it and believe. The fountain of my everlasting kingdom, saith he, truly shall be laid upon earth in the hearts of men, but the building is with God eternal in the heavens. The tomb through which I have passed is its gate, and all who would come after me and enter in must follow in my footsteps. Thomas then asked his Lord whither he would go and the way, how he would leave the earth since he could die no more. Thou shalt see for thyself ere many days pass, answered Jesus. In that I have risen, all whom my Father giveth me shall rise also from the dead, and those whom I raise up I will take with me the way I go. For where I am, they shall evermore be with me also. Such, dear Father, is a brief account of what John has told us, touching the divine teaching of Messiah, the Son of God, respecting his kingdom. Yet much is still mysterious, but we know enough to be willing to trust ourselves to him for this life and for that which is to come. We know that all power is given into his hands, and that he can save all men who believe in and accept him. What is remarkable, dear Father, notwithstanding the Jews have heard that Jesus walks everywhere through Jewry, yet no efforts are made to lay hands on him. And at his presence, crowds of his enemies fly like the stricken multitude before the advancing Sirocco. His presence in Judea is a present dread, like some great evil to those who fear him, but like a celestial blessing to more who love him. Pilate, on the eve of making a journey last week to Bethel before quitting the city, dispatched couriers in advance to ascertain whether Jesus the Crucified was on the line of his route. Caiaphas, having occasion to go to Jericho a few days after the Passover, hearing that Jesus had been seen with his disciples on the road, made a circuit round by Luz and Shiloh in order not to meet him. The gates of the city are kept constantly shut, lest he should enter within the walls, some of the chief priests fearing greatly to behold his face, while others imagine that he is engaged in raising an army to advance upon and take Jerusalem from the Romans. I rejoice to see by your last letter that you may be expected to reach here the week after next. Oh, that you were here now, that you might be taken by John to see Jesus, for from what he says he will not long remain visible among us. Whither he goeth or how he goeth away, no man can say. Faithfully, your loving daughter, Adina.